This here is another viewer's broken gaming PC. And this one is a bit larger than normal, barely fit in the front of my car. It has an RTX 3070 in it, I believe a Ryzen 7 5800X. I mean, all around a very well-balanced, very powerful gaming PC. And the backstory to this one is that, uh, well, it was assembled with new components. This owner waited quite a while to find a 3070 at a good price, so kudos to him for having you know patience in this market. Uh, and he went to turn it on for the first time, and things lit up, but he got no picture out. And believe it or not, this PC has sat like this, with this symptom, for over a year. I just cannot wrap my head around a build this fresh, this good looking, this new, this powerful, never having been properly turned on and used. It has never gamed a single time because it has not worked since its assembly. How on earth does this viewer sleep at night? I just don't know how he waited over a year to fix this dang thing. I mean, when I was talking to him in person, he said, you know, life, life just happens and, and things that are a bit more important obviously have to take precedence. I, I understand that, uh, but just, you know, as a PC builder, uh, it, it just kind of hurts a little bit to know that this build hasn't been properly used yet. So uh, hopefully we can fix this thing up for him in this video. Stay with me. Crucial brings 40 plus years of quality and expertise as a brand of Micron to their new external SSDs, the X6 and the X8. They bring an ideal price to performance ratio with reliability you can count on when you're on the go. They're compatible with PC, Mac, Xbox, PlayStation, and more. So if you're a frequent traveler, working remotely, or just don't wanna fuss around with a screwdriver, simply connect a Crucial X6 or X8 to your favorite device via USB-C and transfer away. You can learn more about Crucial X6 and X8 SSDs SDs via the link below. Hi there, and welcome to Fixer Flop Season 2. There is an entire first season that you might have missed. Check it out, it's also in this playlist. Uh, but here, what we attempt to do is fix viewer systems in and around the Orlando, Florida area for free. That's right, we charge zero dollars and zero cents. All I ask in return is that they allow us to film these troubleshooting processes. I can make money by monetizing videos like these on YouTube and elsewhere, and I don't feel like offloading any of that cost to the viewer who's already gracious enough to loan us his or her system, and who often has to drive at least 30 minutes to an hour, heck, Orlando traffic, if you're coming from Tampa or coming from Lakeland or even Jacksonville, Miami, we've had, um, that's a pretty, pretty big commitment. Uh, so I appreciate that from these viewers. Now, when it comes to this build, I have a couple of ideas to what could be causing the no post issue. It's either more than likely, I think, uh, an incompatible BIOS, you know, maybe just plugging in, uh, again, if it's a 5000 series, then three CPU and put it into an X570 motherboard. Some of those boards don't have the most up-to-date BIOS to support Zen 3 architecture. So that could be a possibility. Also could be just something uh, very simple, like maybe a cable's unplugged, possibly on the power supply side or some other connection that's either um, plugged into the wrong port, let's say, or maybe there's just like a cable that's not plugged in at all. Um, he also told me that some of his fans, his Fantex fans in particular, are not lighting up. Uh, so obviously the, the system was getting power at some point. He was able to see some of the fans spin but again, no picture out means your bill is practically a paperweight, so yeah. The other obvious thing I want to tackle is cable management. It does look a bit rough here in front of the motherboard, and I imagine behind the motherboard tray, it also looks quite rough, so there's that. So three things I want to tackle here. First off, obviously the no post issue. Uh, second, we want to address the RGB functionality here with these fans from Fantex. Uh, apparently those aren't working. Uh, and then three, we're going to clean it up, cable manage, and then this build should be A-OK. -okay. So with all that out of the way, let's get into the troubleshooting process. First thing we need to do is plug this thing in and attempt to replicate the issue or issues described by the owner. In this case, again, it's a no post, so when we power it on, we should get lights from at least some of the fans, maybe lights in the graphics card, but no picture out. It's a no signal on the screen. So with everything plugged in, let's give this a shot. Power on the power supply. Push the power button up front. Ooh, yeah, we've got some like, yeah, we've definitely got some issues with these Fantex fans. So this one's spinning but not lit up. The front ones are kinda, I don't know. Some of them are lighting up and some aren't. So it's a bit strange. And no picture, like at all. Actually, we have a Dr. Debug LED on this motherboard, D0, D0. That is a, well, that's a start. Ooh, we've got another debug indicator up here and this top LED is for the CPU. So I'd be willing to bet at this point that this is a BIOS incompatibility of some sort. So I'm gonna remove this graphics card just so we can identify the motherboard a bit better. I think this is an X570 Unify. Uh, man, I hate it when these boards don't make it apparently obvious. 
I can't tell, I'm gonna have to look it up. But uh, I don't expect anything is wrong with the graphics card just because again, we're getting a bunch of signs from the motherboard itself, from the debug LEDs, uh, that it is a CPU issue instead. Now I did already check that his RAM is seated properly, so no issues there. And I've also checked vital connections, namely his 24 pin, his two 8 pin EPSs up top that power his CPU and his two supplemental PCIe power uh, cables. Those were all connected properly, both on the component side and the power supply side. I've also manually cleared a CMOS. This motherboard has a dedicated button for it that did nothing. So at this point, I am about 95% sure that his BIOS is incompatible with his CPU. A lot of X570 boards came out around the same time as these 5000 series chips or, or when they were announced at least and by that point usually most motherboard vendors are pumping out the latest BIOS so that you don't have this kind of issue that we're having here where all of your hardware technically works they're just not able to communicate properly with each other. Uh, so because this system was built so early it sounds like if again it was built a year and a half or so ago um, that sounds like it was before 5000 series chips were released that's why this is happening. Uh, at least that's what I expect. So I am on the vendors page here and we're gonna download the latest BIOS for the X570 Unify. Now at this point you might be thinking, well, Greg, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place because even if we know that the BIOS is what needs to be updated, we can't get into the BIOS to update it because the system won't post. That's where certain boards like this one here, this MSI Unify board, uh, come into play with their BIOS flashback utility. Now some vendors might call it certain things. We have a video dedicated to this exact procedure we're about to, uh, to, to run through here in this video uh, and I will have it linked in the video description. It's how to update your BIOS without a CPU or without a compatible CPU. Uh, you actually don't even need to turn your system on to update your BIOS if your motherboard supports this BIOS flashback function. I'm going to show you how to do it right now. So what we've got here is the MSI ROM. Sorry, I could be screen capping this, but it's only going to take a few seconds. This ROM needs to be dragged into the root of a thumb drive, FAT32 formatted, and it needs to be renamed to MSI.ROM. Now this is only good for boards that are from MSI, obviously, and that support BIOS flashback, which it should indicate somewhere on the product uh, page or on the box that it does support this feature. Now, once your drive is safely removed, you're gonna wanna connect this into the back of your motherboard in the specific USB slot that is designated for the BIOS flashback function. This port here highlighted in red is labeled flash BIOS. This is the one we wanna connect the drive to, and you'll see this button up top here, flash BIOS button. This is the one we're gonna wanna click once our drive is connected. So we'll go ahead and get the drive installed. Let's see if I can get it in one shot. Yes, correct orientation, okay. And then what we're gonna do is connect the system to power, but we're not gonna turn it on. So connect to power and simply flip this switch. You may see things light up on the board, but again, we're not powering the system on. Then simply press the BIOS flash button. You should see an LED light up indicating that the process has started. Do not touch the thumb drive or the PC while this is happening. Now your PC might actually fully turn on as if we had pushed the power button, even though we didn't, because again, you're not supposed to touch anything during this process. Uh, and I think it happened here because there's already a CPU in the socket. You could perform this procedure without a CPU in the socket at all, and it should still work, although your system wouldn't be able to power on, obviously. Uh, ours is, and I've done it both ways. I don't think technically you're supposed to have the CPU already installed, but most of the manuals don't tell you one way or the other. That's why I do it both ways. If it's in there already to begin with, then I just attempt to BIOS flashback uh, with it in there. It's just a bit more work to have to remove it. So uh, everything should be good to go now. I just noticed that the LED at the rear has stopped blinking. So what I'm gonna do is power the system back off. I'm gonna remove this thumb drive. I'm gonna power the system back on, at least at the power supply level. And we're gonna attempt to power the system on. I'm gonna be checking the Dr. Debug LED down here at the bottom to see how things are faring. Hey, would you look at that? The system now posts, and actually we're in Windows, uh, so I think this is booting into an old volume from one of his older drives that he put in here. He told me he has a fresh NVMe, uh, but it has nothing on it, obviously, because he could never get into his system uh, beforehand. So uh, that's great news. It literally just came down to a BIOS update, and folks, this is why it is so important. Uh, not as much now as it was back then, but it's still good to know going forward because AMD might do this again, or heck, Intel might do it, or whoever. Um, if you are unsure about whether or not your mother but will support your CPU out of the box. Do a bit of research, plan ahead, uh, because then you won't run into this issue and potentially suffer downtime of upwards of a year or two. Oh my gosh. And if you're in the same boat as this person where you have a motherboard that supports the BIOS flashback utility, you don't need to borrow a friend's CPU or go onto eBay and buy an older CPU that's already compatible with the board in question. You just need a USB flash drive and an internet connection. Also be sure to reference your motherboard's manual before beginning this process because your steps might be a bit different than the steps for this board here, especially if you're uh, uh, using a Gigabyte board, let's say, or an ASUS board, they still have an equivalent BIOS flashback utility, a BIOS flashback
abstract function, uh, but those steps to get it started might be a tad different. So again, reference those. If you have this exact board though, just follow along as is. You shouldn't have a problem updating your BIOS without a CPU. But we're not quite finished with this one yet. Remember, we still want to cable manage and we still want to fix the LED issues with some of these fans. Uh, you can see the cable management here is a bit rough. Again, we showed that earlier in the video, but what I also want to show you that I didn't show you earlier is the rear of this build. And uh, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty rough. This is a borderline rat's nest. So I think what we're going to be doing is unplugging everything and reconnecting things uh, just in a more orderly fashion, trying to cable manage as we go. So we don't end up with something like this. It'll be a lot cleaner if it needs to get back here and add or remove components later on. Now, I did find some pretty obvious issues. This is a fan cable and it is completely disconnected from the board. It was actually hanging outside of the case uh, through one of these holes here at the bottom. So uh, this will be a quick fix. Just connect this to the board. It does seem like there's a bit of a loop here of cables for RGB for some of the fans as well as the front panel. And I don't think these actually are connected anywhere. I think, I think they're receiving power, uh, or at least the front panel uh, LED strip is, but this cable should be plugged. I don't know. This is kind of it's it's one big loop. Like none of these cables are actually connected to the motherboard, which is why I don't think any of them are turning on. A few moments later. At this point, we've pretty much disconnected everything. The two APN EPSs are still connected, but they're kind of out of the way. Uh, these are all for the RGB functionality of the fans, as well as powering the fans, front I/O. Uh, we've got our USB 3.0, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, USB-C. Um, so a ton of cables over here. We're going to try to clean these up, reconnect these, and then we'll focus on these power supply cables. These are larger, so installing these last makes a bit of sense because these are going to help press down on those smaller cables, keep them nice and tidy. Two thousand years later. Well, uh, it's it's not my best work. Uh, usually I'm a bit better than this, but uh, you know, I've got some zigzaggy lines and things just because these cables aren't long enough. For some reason, this board has a type C header at the bottom of itself, or it's usually on the side. So this cable doesn't traditionally need to be super long. I don't really blame Fantex for that, but it's just kind of frustrating. I like, I like to stick with horizontal and vertical lines for cable routing. And, uh, you know, we've got a bit of a clutter down here. There's just so many different RGB devices. We've got this, like, RGB, like, hub type thing from Lee and Lee for the Lee and Lee fans up top. So it's a big mishmash, and, uh, yeah. Um, it does look a lot cleaner than it did, though. So there's... There's that. But perhaps more importantly, the front here, it does look significantly cleaner. This is what you'll be seeing the most of, of course. And uh, I think we did a pretty good job cleaning it up. You can see I read a PCIe power through the dedicated cutout here. This is specifically what this is for. That's why it's here. Uh, so I went ahead and took advantage of that. That cleans up the front a bit. I've also got the uh, 24 pin tucked in a bit more, cleaned up some cabling up here. There was a lot of clutter underneath and that's just because we have all these different connections for all these different things like USB 3.0. Uh, we've got our fan splitter here. We've got uh, uh, two different RGB connections down here, front IO. So it's just, it's kind of a mess, but uh, I think we did a pretty good job working with it the way that we did. And I suppose one of the last things to do then, make sure that these LEDs now work and that the fans spin because they weren't spinning before. Yes. Okay, our Lee and Lee fans aren't spinning now. <laughs> so it's flip-flop now. Our Fantex fans work and our Lee and Lee fans are not. Wow, they are not even spinning. They aren't even spinning. I wonder if that's just a power issue. Maybe I forgot to connect a SATA power. That's kind of worrying. Aha, was this little cable here. It actually powers all three fans because these unifans link together from Lee and Lee. So that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. All right, I think the build is now fully good to go. Check Dr. Debug. Yep, showing CPU times now, so that means the system has posted. This build is, uh, it's ready to go. And we fixed the cable management problems, we fixed the uh, fan LED problems, and we fixed the no post issue, which perhaps was the most important issue of them all. I'm sure the viewer is gonna be super happy with the way this one turned out. And again, the fact that we can get it working after it being down for so long is gonna be uh, just the icing on the cake. You'll actually get to utilize this really good hardware. And uh, now that we've cleaned up cable management and stuff, I think that uh, it's a really well-rounded build. I mean, it looks really nice. Nice. I like the, the combination of hardware here. I really like this case from Fantex, and uh, I think he'll be set going forward. I don't think he can run into any issues. Now, one thing I'm kind of sort of confused about, I was under the impression that there was more than one storage drive in this build, but there appears to be only one, and I think it's an M.2 because there's no two and a half inch SSD or anything. There's no hard disk drive uh, in the basement. 
I, I thought there was more than one. I was actually going to upgrade him to a really fast NVMe from Crucial, but uh, seeing as though he only has one storage drive, I don't want to touch that because there might be sensitive files on there, of course. Uh, I'm just going to leave it as is. The only issue, though, is that I think that this drive came from a previous Intel build. So migrating all that to an AMD build could cause problems down the line. We've talked about this in older videos, but uh, you tend to have driver conflicts and things. Uh, what typically happens is when you transfer the drive right away, you'll see Windows is repairing drive or updating drivers, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but a lot of those older like Intel drivers will still remain on the drive. And as a result, you could run into blue screens of death, uh, games crashing randomly, all these random just like program freezes and things. Uh, I've run into it personally just from migrating drive. So I don't recommend that. I will let him know uh, that what he should do is take important files from the drive, uh, put them on a thumb drive, and then wipe the drive and start fresh. That's what I would do personally. Uh, or you could clone the drive or whatever, but then you're still kind of carrying over those potential driver conflicts to the new uh, storage device. So uh, it's, yeah, a bit finicky there. That's really the only concern that I have going forward. Everything else though about this build is ready to go. Cable management, like I said, is good. All the fans work. Uh, actually, the build runs fairly quiet as is. It's stock, although we could tweak things a bit more in the BIOS. And uh, he's got a really healthy combination of hardware here. I'm excited for him. He can finally utilize such a powerful build. Deepcool's latest cases, the CK500 and CK560, boast modern, clean designs in both black and white versions like you're seeing here. You'll find excellent hardware support, including 360mm AIOs, EATX motherboards, and graphics cards up to 380mm in length. And depending on the type of build you're after, you can opt for either the basic high airflow version in the CK500 or the extravagant RGB packed into the CK560, airflow still included. You'll also find USB Type-C port integration, tool-free drive mounting, and more. Check them out today via the link below. Now, if you enjoyed watching this video, be sure to let me know by giving this one a thumbs up. That would be greatly appreciated. If you have not subscribed for whatever reason, smash that subscribe button. That's that big red button there right below this video. And uh, you can also hit that bell notification icon as well if you want to be notified when videos like these go live. We're uploading Fix or Flop videos all the time. This tends to be a pretty popular series, so don't worry. It's not going anywhere. Uh, I do appreciate your support in the comment section as well. Leave constructive feedback. If you don't like things, if you want to see other things in the future, uh, I'm all ears, especially within the first hour or two of this video or other videos like this being published published. And uh, yeah, you know, follow me on Twitter, follow me elsewhere. If you want to reach out personally, Twitter tends to be a pretty good way to communicate with me. Uh, Instagram, not so much. Facebook, not so much, but they are available as well. And they're also linked in the video description. Uh, with that, yeah, thanks for watching. And thanks for fixing a build with me.